Good afternoon and welcome to everybody who's watching this video and to all of you who might watch it as part of the recordings that real issue. Um, I'm delighted to be here today with John Kurowski, who is principal trainer from Explayo. Explayo are an accredited training provider for the IS2QB certified tester foundation level 4.0. Um, as a lot of you will know, the CTFL 4.0 was launched back on 9th of May this year. And um, we've had a lot of questions, a lot of queries about it, what's changed, what's been updated. So John, I'm really happy that you're here to talk a little bit about the black box mm -hmm. techniques and mm -hmm. what's changed, what's been updated there. So thank you so much. I'll disappear and leave you to talk. Mm -hmm. Quickie for anybody watching, um, watching live, pop um, questions into the chat box on whichever social media channel you're, you're watching. And I know John will be delighted to try to answer those questions at the end. So over to you, John. Thank you. Thanks, Debbie. Um, hello, everybody. Welcome to this webinar on the black box test techniques. And so my name is John Karofsky. Um, I've been with XPO about 15 years. And so I've been delivering uh, the foundation for about 15 years as well. So just to give you a little bit about myself. Um, there we go, handsome dude. I really must update that photo, to be honest. It's about 10 years old, and I've lost about three stones since then. Um, what can I tell you about myself? Everyone's okay with the John in terms of the surname. It's a Czech surname spelled in a Polish way, so you have to visualize a guy called John in a car going off skiing. You then get John Karofsky. That'll do for the pronunciation. Don't actually like skiing. Um, I prefer the terra firma. You know, the firmer it is, the less the terra, and that is the quality of uh, jokes you're going to hear in this webinar. Um, I have a whole abattoir, sorry, repertoire of bad jokes. Now, not only do I do the ISTQB Foundation, I also do the ISTQB Advanced Test Manager Test Analyst and Technical Test Analyst. So not only do I deliver them, I also develop them as well. So I've managed to get this accredited. And uh, as you can see, also do automation courses, do Agile and do DevOps. What do I do in my spare time? I paint pictures. So if this background uh, wasn't there, I can wave. You can probably see photo, pictures in the background, but uh, that is what I do in my spare time. Okay, so we'll get cracking. So with um, ICQB, we're going to go through the four black box test techniques. So we've got equivalence partitioning, boundary value analysis, decision table, and state transition testing. So we'll start with equivalence partitioning. And what we're going to do is we're going to use an example um, of a robot bouncer standing outside a nightclub. Now, um, I haven't been to nightclubs for, well, decades. I think you're either a clubber or a pubber. And to be honest, um, the music would be way too loud. My feet would be killing me. And I'd be in the middle of a good book anyway. Um, yeah, this is, this is one of these scenarios you can't actually use in courses because you have to use real-world examples. But with the advent of AI, you never know. In five years' time, um, robot bouncers maybe a thing so we've got a robot bouncer standing outside a nightclub and to get in you've got to be 18 or over now what we want to do is just check the robot bouncer is working okay so equivalence partitioning is a very high level test technique so what we've got to consider are what are the groups of people we have to worry about and so i'm sure you can work out the two groups we've got to worry about is 18 or over or under 18 so if we do it as a number line we've got over 18, 18 and over, we've also got under 18. Now, just so happens with this one, above 18 is um, valid and below 18 is invalid. I've colored the, uh, the valid in green and I've colored in the invalid in red because someone was colorblind on a course and so I had to explain the gray and the dark gray. So we've got two partitions. If you see the valid, the squiggly bracket, curly bracket, that actually includes um, the number 18 as well. If you look at the invalid, it's right up close to the 18, but doesn't actually include the number 18. So if we're going to check the robot bouncer is working okay, um, we can actually get this down to just two tests. We could have one that's covering the valid partition, one that's covering the invalid partition. So what we need is someone who's 18 or over. You can tell he's over 18, he's got grey hair, and someone who is under 18. So we can actually use two test cases just to check that the robot is okay. So with those, we can then send them through and see if they get in. Now, the person under 18 shouldn't get in. They should be kicked out. We're not going to go into um, people looking over 18 or anything like that. We're not going to cover 
um, elephants and tortoises that live for a long time either. So um, under 18, they shouldn't get in and the over 18 year olds should get in. And so we just two tests, we can check the robot bouncer is working okay. If we were to send through someone under 18 and the robot bouncer let them in, or if we had someone over 18 and the robot bouncer kicked them out, then um, we would know very quickly with just two tests that the code was not sort of very good. And so we've only done two tests, very high level technique. And uh, as I say, we have checked the robot is working okay. It's not the only testing we would do. And the thing with the equivalence partitioning is we're making a massive assumption. What we're assuming is if we send that one test case through and it's okay, we're then assuming that everybody else in the same partition is treated exactly the same way. They get the same expected result. And that can be anywhere on the line. And ditto with the invalid. We send through anyone who's under 18. We're assuming that everybody in the same partition will be treated the same way. So that one test case is the equivalent of that partition, hence equivalence partitioning. Now, the next thing we need to consider is basically coverage. So what we're thinking about there is the number of partitions we're exercising uh, by at least one test case divided by the total number of identified partitions. So hopefully here you can see there's a valid and an invalid. So we're looking at two. So if we send through the person who's over 18, you'll see we've got an age of 22. When I do this in a course, I say, can you give me a number? Some are over 18. Everyone will say 18. And it's not actually a very good number, but I'm not going to tell you why. I'm going to leave that as a level of mystery and intrigue. When we get to boundary value analysis, and I'll tell you why 18 is not a very good number for checking uh, the 18 or over. But we check 22. You can see the classification there in the valid partition. The expected result, we're going to let them in. And how many partitions are they exercising? They're exercising one partition out of a total of two. So we then get 50% coverage. If we then send the person through who's under 18, that again, as you can see, they're 12, um, they're invalid, we're going to keep them out. They're also exercising one partition out of a total of two. And so they're also doing 50% coverage. If we send both of them through, then we've got 100% coverage. And the thing with test techniques is um, coverage is one of these metrics that can be quite deceptive. If someone asks you, how's the testing going? Oh, we've um, we managed to reach 50% equivalence partition coverage. It sounds like a heck of a lot of tests. Oh, great. You know, let me know when you've run the other 50%. Okay. It's going to take a while, you know, then we send the 12 year old through. So we're looking this way. Now, that is basically um, equivalence partitioning up to sort of foundation 3.1. The other thing as well is, um, you know, if you talk about testing principle number two, exhaustive testing is impossible. When I do UAT courses, and I tell people about this and say, hey, you could just do two tests. Someone will kind of pull their hair out and go, yes, but I've got to do ages 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. I don't know why. I've just got to do those 10. To which I then had a thought about that. And it's interesting because their objective is different to mine. So if you're up at UAT, it's building confidence. So if they have to keep running the same test again and again, getting the same result and if that gives them the confidence it works okay then fine but they only need to do two we don't need to test absolutely everything equivalence partitioning we're applying a model onto the system and this particular model is suggesting two tests and so if we run the two tests then we've got 100 percent equivalence partition coverage if you were going to do you know 19 20 21 22 23 they're all in the valid partition you're still only covering the one partition. So you've got to make sure the two test cases are in the different partitions. And as I say, this is where we got up to with um, previous version of the syllabus. It has now changed a bit. So what they're now doing is, it always used to be just one area of data, one classification. They can now do two. And it used to be kind of numbers, but now it's not so much numbers. So I've got... Robot bounce has been improved. It's now 18 or over and no trainers. So ha, I wouldn't get in now. And so with this, we then got to think about two areas of data. And so these are known as classifications. We've got the age. We're looking at are they less than 18? Are they greater than or equal to 18? And then we've got are they wearing trainers? Yes and no. And so I could have drawn um, age as another number line. 
but instead I've drawn them as boxes. And so it's different ways, it's whichever way is, is useful. What's handy about this is I can label them. So the areas of data are officially known as classifications and the different options are known as equivalence partitions, equivalence classes. But we've now got two lots of data. And because I'm a wonderful guy, <clears throat> I've highlighted the, the valid ones in green and the invalid ones in red. So the valid ones are the two on the left, on the right, and the invalid is the two on the left. Now, when you look at testing this, now we could get away with two tests when it was just the age. So we could do, you know, Grayson are equal to 18, not wearing trainers. And it is very tempting to do the other two together do both invalid and have another test case. You know, hey, presto, two test cases, 100% coverage, we're okay. But we can't do the invalid one because there is a thing called um, error masking or defect masking. If we send through someone who is under 18 and they're wearing trainers, well, then they're going to be rejected, but we don't know why. Was it because of the age? Was it because they were wearing trainers? Now. If the age was coded incorrectly, let's say instead of it being greater than or equal to 18, it was greater than or equal to eight. Well, you're never going to find that because they're being chucked out because of the wearing trainers. They're not, you know, they're wearing trainers. They will be thrown out. So the trouble with doing both invalids at the same time is you get the correct result. They're going to be kicked out, but you don't know which one of these partitions actually did um, the rejecting. So what we have to do is instead of doing them together, so that's the first one, that's the happy path. 22, not wearing trainers. We're going to let them in. And as you can see, the coverage is now two over four. And there's two partitions. We now got a total of four partitions. So it's giving us 50% coverage still. But what we now have to do is we now have to test each invalid separately. So we've got one there, 12, not wearing trainers. Again, it's 50% coverage. We haven't covered all of them because we've done um, the same not wearing trainers twice. And then we've got the third one there where we're going from greater than or equal to 18. And yes, they are wearing trainers. So again, those three test cases together give us 100% coverage. But if you added the three up, it would say 150 because we're doing the same one, same couple more than once. And so this is the thing with equivalence partitioning. You can't do both invalids at the same time. And in a room, a lot of people start twitching and saying, but I want to. So I then say, well, decision table testing is on the way. Hey, guess what we do there? So that is basically equivalence partition coverage. So in terms of the three test cases, we send them through. First one should be OK. The other two should be kicked out. So that is basically where it's now gone into. We're now getting more than one area of data. So you've got two classifications. And so it's, uh, well, I'll show you another example. We've got a drinks machine here. Does tea, coffee, hot chocolate, also milk, yes and no, sugar, yes and no. So with this one, technically, there aren't any um, invalid partitions. Everything is kind of valid because you can either have tea, coffee or hot chocolate. No one's going to say if you pick coffee, they're a wrong answer. It's not like that. But what we now look at is we're looking at different areas. So we've got tea, coffee, hot chocolate. We've got the drinks classification. We've got milk, yes or no. Sugar, yes or no. And again, I'm not actually going to color any of them red or green because they're all valid. But now what we then have to think about is um, what's the minimum number of tests in order to test these? So if we wanted to test these combinations, now it is very tempting to think, well, there are three drinks, there's two milk and two sugar. So three times two is six times two is 12. We could cover every possible combination in 12 tests, which is all very good, um, but it could get exhaustive. If we then have things like uh, another drink, I can't think of one offhand, but if we have four drinks and then um, the only drink, think, drink I'm thinking of is lemon tea and you don't have that with milk. Or if you do, it looks odd. That would then be four times two times two. That would then be uh, 16 rather than 12. It would get very big very quickly. So something else the syllabus talks about is each choice coverage. So with each choice coverage, what we're doing is we're looking at the minimum number of tests to cover each partition just the once. 
And a general rule of thumb, if it's an example like this one, you can get away with looking at which one's got the largest number of partitions. In this case, drink's got three, milk's got two, sugar's got two. We should be able to cover all of them in three tests. So test case number one, tea with milk and with sugar. We can then do test case number two, coffee without milk and without sugar. And then the last one is hot chocolate. It doesn't matter if it's with milk or with sugar because you see it's a dotted line there. As long as the third test covers hot chocolate, then we're okay. Something else to consider is there's also input partitions and output partitions. So you could be checking the inputs or you could check just uh, the actual output partitions. So, for instance, if you went to uh, a supermarket and wanted to check whether you get a meal deal or not, you may be just checking um, the output partitions. There could be loads of different inputs, loads of different sandwiches and snacks and drinks. They give you a meal deal or don't give you a meal deal. If you wanted to check, you can get a meal deal and not a meal deal out of the uh, checkout. Then you could be just checking the output partition. So with the robot bouncer, basically we just got to expect your results, keep out and let in. And again, um, it's three tests. You know, we've got the happy path. We can then check one invalid, the other invalid. And again, they're all giving us 50% coverage. They're covering three out of six. So hopefully that is equivalence partitioning. What I'll do now is move on to boundary value analysis. So we're just going back to the original one, which is 18 or over. So what are we doing with boundary value analysis? We're looking at the edges of ranges. So we've got 18 there. We're going to look at look at 18. We're going to go to the left, one step to the left and one step to the right. So see, the trouble is you could do it in years. If you did it in days, it gets really annoying because, um, I mean, I've got birthday today, birthday yesterday, birthday tomorrow. If you talk about birthday tomorrow, then today they would be 17 years and 364 days old. But next year, it being a leap year, then they'll be 17 years and 365 days old. So it does get um, a bit confusing. So I've just called it birthday today, birthday tomorrow, birthday yesterday. So this is why. Basically, birthday yesterday, he's eating the cake. Birthday today, hey, hasn't blown the candles out yet. And birthday tomorrow, yet to do the candles. And if we were to, uh, and then we've got the classification, it's basically valid, they'd be let in. Birthday today would be let in. Birthday tomorrow, they shouldn't be let in. So should let in birthday yesterday, birthday today, um, but not birthday tomorrow. And we're not going to talk about time zones either, you know, because New Zealand is 12 hours ahead. We're not going to talk about time zones. You know, I am 18 in New Zealand. Well, you're in the UK. So can do things this way. Now, there are two different levels of boundary value analysis. We've got three value and we've also got two value. Now, I think the syllabus used to be neutral on this. The questions are either three value or two value, but now they're specifically talking about them. And with three value, we're basically checking on the boundary. We've got, in this case, I've done whole years, just to save me saying birthday today, birthday tomorrow. Go one year to the left and one year to the right. So we're checking the value, which is, the, the last value that's less than 18, we're talking about the very first value that's greater than 18. So it's three value. So we're checking on the boundary. And one of those will be uh, the very last invalid value before the boundary. And the next one will be the next value after the boundary. Two value boundary value analysis. I used to draw a fence in between 17 and 18, but the wording has changed. So they talk about the boundary and the very last invalid value before the boundary, which in this case is 17. Now, why do we check the uh, the values at the ends of ranges? I mean, surely if we've done equivalence partitioning, we sent through a 22-year-old, albeit grey hair, sent through a 12-year-old, and um, they're okay. Why are we checking the boundary? Well, the boundaries, the edges of ranges are seen as higher risk than the middle of the range. And um, unofficially, it's where developers make mistakes. So. If the developer was meant to code it as greater than or equal to 18, they may accidentally code it as greater than 18 or equal to 18. Now, if we run the test of three value, they are ticks. That basically means the, the test is going to get the right result. So if they've coded it as greater than 18, where you're sending it the value 17, 18, and 19, 17, 
you know, um, would keep out, that'd be okay. 18 would keep us out, that'd be a defect. 19 would be okay. Greater than or equal to 18. 17 would keep out, 18 and 19, it would find those. But with three value, if it's equal to 18, then it would actually find that as a defect. Because we're checking the numbers 17, 18 and 19, 17 it would reject, 18 would accept. Now 19 should accept, but if it was set as equal to 18, then 19 would come up with a defect. So three value would find that. Two value wouldn't find the bottom one. If it was just set as equal to 18 and we were just checking 17 and 18, it wouldn't find the last one. So this takes me back to equivalence partitioning when everyone would use a value 18. And I say, well, it's not a very good value because if they coded it as equal to 18, very high level with tests, we think that uh, range is working okay, but it wouldn't be. So that's basically two value um, and three value. It is the ends of ranges. Now, they talk about it being used with equivalence partitioning. If the partitions are ordered, so in other words, if they're numerical or if they're alphabetical, then um, we can do boundaries. We can work out where the edge of a boundary is and where the beginning of the next one is. So we couldn't do it for whether they're wearing trainers, yes or no, but we can do it for whole numbers. Well, I say whole numbers. If it was something like um, pounds and pence, if you're talking about 18 pounds, then it would be, you know, 17 99 18 pounds and a penny. So I talk about one to the left, one to the right. It could be uh, one year to the left, one to the right. could be a day either way. could be an hour either way. could be a decimal point. It is literally up to um, how the system is designed. If it was an ATM, then the lowest note you can get is um, five pounds, then it would be five to the left, five to the right. Terms of coverage, number of boundary values exercise divided by the top number in there. So if we're looking at 17 and 18, if we did test case one, 17, we're covering one boundary out of two, gives us 50% coverage. If we're talking three value, then 17 would be one out of three, which would be 33%. All three would give us 100%. So on two value, doing both of those would give us um, 100% as well. When I ask people, you know, what would you do in real life, two value or three value? Um, there's no right answer to that. Two value is quicker, but it's riskier. Three value takes longer, but it gives you greater confidence. So if you did a thousand boundaries, two value would be 2,000 tests, three value would be 3,000 tests. It would be quicker, but it would be riskier if they ever coded anything as equals to. Anyway, that was boundary value analysis. Um, move on to decision tables. So with decision tables, again, we've got the example, uh, robot bouncer, you've got to be 18 or over and not wearing trainers. So the idea of decision tables, it's complex business rules. Combinations of conditions give you different actions. So with this one, in terms of the conditions, are we over 18? Are we wearing trainers? And then the action would be to let them in. Now, we could have another action, which is keep out, but the... The true of let in would be the false for let out. The false for let in would be the true for let out. Everywhere where one was set to true or false, the other one would be set the opposite. So we can do the keep out by doing the false for let in. Now, what we're looking at here is uh, with each condition, it's either a yes or a no or a true or a false. It's basically binary. So if we had the one condition, it would only be two tests. We just check a, a yes and a no. Because there are two conditions we then got to check every combination of them so you know true 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 false false true false false now a very quick way of working this out is two to the number of conditions so two to the power of two is four it will be four columns four tests each one of these columns is a test case if we had three conditions and it'd be two times two is four times two is eight um, 4 be 16, 5, 32. 10 would be 1024 it gets very complex very quickly now, what we do, filling this in, we've got four rules, and so we just halve it. So with each one of these conditions, half have to be true, half to have to be false. So there are four, so we halve it, do two yes, two no. We've done two yes, two no, halve it again. We do one yes, one no, one yes, one no. Got every possible combination. If there are three conditions, then it'd be four yes, four no, and then two yes, two no. What we then do is we work out um, the actions. And as you can see, um, the actions look different. It's a different notation. So we're not putting a kiss underneath rule number two. The X is saying that is somewhere where we're doing an actual action. So where they're blank, blank is equivalent of a false or a no, and the X is equivalent of a true or a yes. So as you can see there, if they are over 18, not wearing trainers, then we will let them in. All the other ways, we wouldn't let them in. 
So in terms of these, we've got, uh, we now got four test cases. So people that are really bothered about equivalence partitioning, we can't test both invalid. Well, with this particular um, scenario, yes, we can. And I just realized, oh no, they are okay. Now looking at the table, one thing they've added to this, um, the syllabus is the fact we can collapse them. So if you have a look at rules three and four, it doesn't matter if they're, well, if they're not over 18, it doesn't matter if they're wearing trainers or not. So what we can do is we can collapse those two rules and just do an N with a dash. Dash basically means yes or no. Or another way of doing this is if they're wearing trainers, they're not going to get in. So we could change that to a dash with a yes. So we can actually collapse the table. So this is something new in the syllabus. They, they talk about collapsing the tables. So is there any way we can collapse them? Are there any rules we could collapse together? So with four rules, there's a very good chance you'd run all four of them. But if it was eight, and if we could reduce it down to just five conditions or five tests, then, um, you know, it's, again, it's quicker, it's riskier. If we do every single rule, then it's uh, going to take longer, but it gives us greater confidence. Now, where this pops in is coverage. So you're looking at number of exercised columns divided by the number of feasible columns. I'll get into feasible and infeasible in a moment. But if we take the happy path, um, over 18, not wearing trainers, we're actually covering one out of four, which is 25%. We then did um, the collapse table or the compressed table. It's got names. The one on the left is known as the simple table. The one on the right is known as complex. Uh, uncollapsed, collapsed, uncompressed, compressed. They have different names think the latest is collapsed. So it's one out of three gives us 33% coverage. Now, if we're talking about infeasible columns, we've got one here where it's a cinema. Um, if you're 12 or over, you can see a 12. If you're 15 or over, you can see a 15. If you're 18 or over, you can see an 18. And we've got the whole table there, but we do have infeasible columns. So, so far you've seen in the actions, we've got X's and spaces. We can also have NA's. Nah. So if you look at rule number three, you can't have a test case where, yes, they're over, they're over 12 or they're 12 or over, but they're not over 15. And yes, they're over 18. We can't do that. Ditto with um, rule number five. We can't be not over 12, but over 15 and 18. So we can have um, infeasible columns. And what we do is we take those out. So when we remove the columns, you can see we're now down to four test cases. Now, looking at that, it's a bit confusing in terms of we've got 12 or over, 15 or over, 18 or over. Your next thing is going to say, well, does it always have to be boundary? Um, does it always have to be binary? Is there some other way we could express that which does uh, collapse the number of um, rows? To which I then say yes. Something else that has come in is extended entry tables. So it doesn't necessarily always have to be yeses and noes. So if you see there with the age, We've actually got ranges of ages. We can go 0 to 11, 12 to 14, 15, 17, 18 plus. And as you can see there, so we could have them as conditions, binary, yes or no, or we could actually do the extended entry table and we could do it that way. So this is decision tables. Last one to go through is state transition. So there's a couple of things popped up here. So... Um, with state transition testing, what I've got is a greeting card. It's one of these that when you open it, it plays music. And when you close it, the music stops. It's about the easiest diagram I can think of because you can have the cards can be in an open state or a closed state. How we go from open to closed, bear with me if I'm getting too technical, but we're going to um, close the card. And what happens when we close the card, the music stops. How do we go from closed back to open again? Well, we open the card and the music plays. This gives me a chance just to label the diagram. If you see anything that's a circle or a square, it's a state. It's basically a situation that the application will um, stay in, in, diff in, basically, you know, could be infinitely, indefinitely. It will remain in that state until a trigger moves it across. So open card, closed card is a trigger. What takes you from the closed state to the open state while opening the card will do this otherwise it will stay in a closed state in theory forever until you do something at the minute um where i am the light is in an off state i could switch it on it be in an on state and it will stay on till i switch it off or some other trigger like the bulb blows 
Now, in terms of music plays, that's basically an action. So the trigger or event is kind of like the input. That is what moves us from one uh, state to another state. And these lines are known as single transitions. How do we move from one state to another state? Well, we make a transition from that state to another state, hence state transition testing. Now, with every diagram, um, you know, the, the, it, you have to have every state in there. So there's uh, one or two elsewhere where we go from ground floor on the lift to the first floor in the lift. And uh, you have to have a moving up state and a moving down state. It's not a teleport. So any state that the um, application will remain in, you have to have that as an actual state. Now, one way of doing this is by a drawing. And another way of doing this is with the state event table. So the states go down the bottom, the events go along the top. So in terms of the, and the end states is where we end up. So underneath the states, we've got open and closed. Underneath the events, we've got cl a closed card and open card. And then we work our way through it. So if we do a closed card from open, then the next state will be closed. If we did an open card from open, well, we can't actually do that. So we can either put a dash in there or leave it blank. Sometimes you see the word null in there. Some people say, well, wouldn't you put the state open because that would be the end state, to which I then say, well, no. You can have state transition diagrams with the transition points back in itself. So if we're like an MP3 player, I don't know if anyone still has them, um, but if you have an MP3 player, it can be in a play state. If you press the next button, take you to the next track and take you back to a play state. This over the previous button will take you back that way. So we've got a dash in there to show it's an invalid transition. You can't open the card any more than it is. So from closed, we can't do a closed card. And from closed, we can open the card and we end up at open. So if you look in the di in the, the table, you see there's two valid transitions. There's two lines on the diagrams. Hey, they match. What's also good about the state table, it also shows you all the invalids. So you would take the number of states, multiply it by the number of triggers. Hey, presto, you then got um, the number of possible valids and invalids. Now, what has changed in the syllabus is the way they dis they talk about coverage. So there are three types of coverage they're going to talk about. So the first one is all states coverage. Just to go back a bit, just to so you appreciate the uh, colors on the slide. If you notice, the diagram is all in black at the moment. When I talk about all states coverage, which is in uh, the XBO purple, you see that the states are now um, in purple. And what we're looking at is a test that will navigate um, through the diagram and cover all the states. So we've got a few choices in there. We've got open to closed. We could go from the open state to the closed state. We could do open card. We could do closed card. We could mention it by the trigger. We could mention it by the state. Either way, we're describing how we're navigating through the diagram. We could also do close to open. Just haven't got the space to do that. Valid transitions coverage. So what we're looking at there, again, is we're looking at a test that navigates through all of the valid transitions. Now, this particular diagram is a loop, so we can get away with just doing one test. We could go from open to close to open or close to open to closed, open card to close card. You know, all of those will cover the valid transitions. And the last level of coverage is all transitions coverage. So it covers all of the valid transitions and also all the uh, invalid transitions. So the other two, it's been, well, it could be this test or this one or that one with all transitions coverage. It's got to be a test that covers the valid transitions coverage and also all the invalids. So as you can see, their open card to close card covers the valids. And then open card from open is invalid, closed card from closed is also invalid as well. So these are the latest um, levels of coverage that they have brought into uh, state transition. So again, something else they brought in is the idea of guard conditions. So again, we've got the robot bouncer, 18 or over, no trainers. Now, the robot bouncer is going to sit there and will stand there in a wait state, basically until a clubber arrives. What's he going to do? Look at their face, check their age. And here we've got a... We've got a guard condition. We're going to check their age. If it's less than 18, we're going to kick them out. And the other side of that, check if they're greater than equal to 18. Looking at the shoes, checking the shoes again. Checking if the shoes are not okay, we're going to kick them out. 
if the shoes are okay, we're going to let them in. So I let them in and then go back to a waiting state and we'll stay in that state till another club arrives. So something else that has come up in the syllabus this time, um, as well as the coverage, they also talk about the guard conditions as well. And that's pretty much everything. So um, thank you for your time. And I will hand you back to Debbie. Thank you, John. So much information there. Just to reassure people that you will be able to watch this again because we'll um, obviously have recordings on our channels and you'll be able to tune in and see what John shared there. Absolute wealth of information. Um, let's just try to do um, some questions. Um, Alex, there's one from Sagar here. Yeah, what is um, meant by one dimensional equivalence partitioning coverage is the same as each choice coverage? I'm glad you asked that because I completely forgot to mention East Choice coverage, which was uh, when I was doing the drinks machine. So talking about every possible combination, which was 12, but it is what I was talking about was each Choice coverage. So, yeah, that is new in the syllabus as well. So each Choice coverage is going through. Um, it is the minimum to cover all of the options um, with the different classifications. So talking about one-dimensional one dimensional, I think, is just one classification. So you're looking at just the one classification. So when you're looking at drinks, it'd be the tea, uh, the coffee, and the hot chocolate. So looking at that, I am seeing that as more than one um, dimension. That's the way I see it. Thank you. You've got a lot of thank yous here, John. Um, so um, really appreciated session. Um, another question um, here from Sega. Um, why three value BVA? Um, why we choose 17, 18, 19? And why not 16, 17, 18 or 16, 17, 18, 19? Okay, because 18 is the actual boundary. So we're on the boundary. So you're looking um, with three value at the very last invalid value before the boundary and the very first valid value after the boundary. So when we're looking at 18, 17 was the very last invalid and 19, you know, was, was the next valid. So that is why. So 18 is the middle one. It's when we're equal to the boundary. 17 is less than and 19 is greater than. Uh, you talk about 16, 17, 18, 19. That is actually for value boundary value analysis. And I don't know whether that is in the syllabus. Um, it is in the test analyst. I know we have to mention yes. it then, the advanced test analyst. But um, if it's two value, it would just be 17 or 18. 16, 17, 18, 19 is four value. So that is why it's the middle one. Thank you. We're up against the clock, but I'm just going to let things go a little bit longer. Um, does the syllabus no longer cover use cases as a test technique? <laughs> no, it doesn't. Um, use cases is no longer in there which is a bit of a shame. Um, sorry, any opinion I'm expressing is my personal opinion. It's not ISQIs or ISTQBs or XBOs. Because um, the four we've got now, you could sort of do down at component level and use cases was more at a system test level. Mm -hmm. So um, it is useful. I mean, what they brought in, because they've added about a third of the Agile extension in, there's another section, which is uh, collaboration uh, test approaches. And so that is sorry, collaborative test approaches. That includes card conversation, confirmation, and acceptance test room development. I think use cases is that to move out of the way to make a uh, way for this. And so they are now looking at a test. It's not a test technique, but it's a test approach. That section at the end of section four is looking at how to prevent defects, whereas what I've been going through is how to detect defects. That's okay. Um, why does the equivalence partitioning now include more than one classification? Um, that's a good question, um, because um, it used to be at the test analyst level, we then looked at more than one classification. It's now down at that level. Um, reliably informed, it's because this is more like real life. So when mm -hmm. some people are coming into foundation and they're getting their first um, certified exam pass, is um, in the real life, they're more likely to be looking at scenarios or, or testing applications where it isn't just the one um, area of testing or the one classification they need to look at. It will be looking at more than one. And also there are things where there are not always number lines. So that's why we've got trainers, yes or no, in there. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Um, Godwin, you're asking a question about a link. Um, what we'll do is these links will stay live on our ISKI channels that you're watching now, but also we'll pop um, a link onto our YouTube channel. And that's where we tend to um, have all of our recordings from, from these webinars. Um, one more question, perhaps, for John. Okay. Which tra state transition testing does the syllabus, um, with state transition testing, does the syllabus still mention zero switch and one switch coverage? Um, I think it talks about zero switch in one place. So I, yeah. So in terms of zero switch, it is sequences of one transition. So if I wanted to get a train from, let's say, London to Leeds, it's a direct train. I haven't had to switch journey. So it's like a zero switch journey. If I wanted to go from, I know, London to Bradford, I don't think it's a direct train. On a Sunday, certainly not. You have to go to Leeds and then change and get another train to Bradford. That would be a sequence of two trains, which would be mm -hmm. one switch. And always used to talk about one switch in the foundation just in case, because when you talk about zero switch, everyone says, well, what's one switch then and what's two switch? You know, and so you have to explain it. But I think in one place they talk about valid transitions coverage is also zero switch coverage. So it's mentioned in one place. Um, but, yeah, they, uh, I don't know if one switch is still uh, relevant. Thank you, John. We, we've gone a little bit over. Um, a, a huge thank you. Um, John, you're an accredited training provider, an accredited trainer, and I think that you've been absolutely fantastic in um, sharing the, the information regarding the different test techniques and highlighting the changes. Um, I, I can't echo Radhika's um, thoughts more than that. Really easy to listen to, pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you to everybody who's joined us. Thank you. See you again soon. Bye.